Hi, thanks for stopping by. I'm going to share with you a story today about my 13th great-grandfather, and his name is Stephen Hopkins. Now, Stephen Hopkins was born in England. He was uh, considered to be just an ordinary shopkeeper. Um, one of the uh, uh, accounts I read that he was actually a glass merchant. Uh, but that was just in one of uh, several things that I read, so I'm not quite sure what kind of a shop he kept. Um, but uh, at the age of 28, uh, in the year 1609, Stephen left his wife and I think either two or three small children, depending on the, the account that you read, and he signed a contract with the Virginia Company of London where he agreed to travel to a new colony uh, in the New World by the name of Jamestown. Now, he would be, uh, as part of this uh, contract, an indentured servant for seven years, where he would work very hard, um, and at the end of that seven years, he would be granted 30 acres of land in and around the Jamestown area. So, he signed up for this and set sail, and uh, on a ship by the name of the Sea Venture. Uh, and actually there were several ships that were going, but uh, this was the flagship, the Sea Venture. And when they were out at sea, a terrible hurricane came up, and the Sea Venture was uh, shipwrecked on a place known as the Island of Devils, and, uh, or the Island of the Devil. And we now know that uh, it was an uninhabited island at the time as a little island by the name of Bermuda. And uh, the ship ran aground uh, on some rocks. Uh, those that could swim jumped in. Uh, it said that uh, 13th great-grandfather Stephen was able to cling on to a cask of wine and paddled in. It was about a mile out from the reef to the shore in Bermuda, and there that entire crew, not a single person was lost, either in the storm or in the shipwreck or by drowning trying to get to the island. Um, they all made it alive, uh, and one account says that even the ship dog made it to shore. So stranded on this island, a uh, deserted island, which we now know as Bermuda, they lived there for 10 months. And, uh, of course, as you can imagine, everything they needed, fresh water, good food, um, there were many who decided they didn't want to leave. And uh, at one point, uh, Stephen was charged with mutiny. Um, apparently, he was uh, fighting against the governor uh, of the land, who was probably more than likely the ship's captain. Um, he was tried for mutiny. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to death. Um, in one of the accounts I read that both his, himself and his shipmates begged for his life to be spared, and it was. Um, after 10 months, uh, they were able to make it back out to the sea venture, the shipwreck, to salvage wood and everything else they could from that, and they actually created two small ships, which I'm guessing were more likely uh, almost like rafts, and they set sail again, and they actually made it to Jamestown. And um, we don't know how long he was there in Jamestown, but uh, at one point uh, it says that because he had a very good knowledge of the scriptures, he was asked to be the clerk to uh, the clergyman, and uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so he survived the, uh, the shipwreck, he survived the storm, made it on to Bermuda, and uh, was there to see Jamestown almost go under uh, because of famine, because of sickness, because of disease. Um, but it did say that one of the things, because he was involved with uh, a guy by the name of Reverend Buck, uh, that he actually was there and helped perform the marriage ceremony of uh, one of Stephen Hopkins' fellow Bermuda castaways by the name of John Rolfe. And if any of you have paid attention in school, you know that John Rolfe was married 
to a young lady by the name of Pocahontas. And uh, Stephen was there for that. Um, after several years, of course, Jamestown was really struggling. Stephen re returned back to England, um, having received notice that his wife, Mary, had died and that his estate had been liquidated and his two children became wards of the church. Um, after some time, uh, Stephen was able to regain custody of his two children and he married again, a lady by the name of Is Elizabeth Fisher. Um, Stephen then changed professions. He worked as a tanner, um, I guess preparing uh, hides uh, for leather. And uh, he lived uh, near a place that is called Hennage House. And uh, it turns out that Hennage House, uh, there were a group of people who uh, were living there that were the leaders of a group called the Pilgrims. And when asked, uh, because he had already been to the New World, he was familiar with the Virginia area. He also, uh, his time, uh, I won't get into a lot of it, but he had spent a lot of time working with the Indians. He knew several of the uh, Indian dialects. And so he would be considered a very valuable person to have with him um, on these pilgrims, wanted him with him to sail on a ship that was known as the Mayflower. And so uh, Stephen joined them, 1620, uh, the Mayflower set sail, and Stephen brought uh, his wife Elizabeth, with, uh, who was pregnant at the time, uh, with three small children. Uh, I guess these were probably getting a little bit older. He had maybe not small children, but three of his children, his pregnant wife, along with two of their men servants, as he called them, set sail uh, again to the New World. Um, now, he was a little bit older at this time. He was almost 40 years of age uh, when they set sail, and he was very experienced. He was a skilled hunter, a skilled fisherman, and was the only one of the entire crew who had actually been to the New World. And uh, having the chance to communicate with the Indians was a big plus, too. Now, Stephen was very instrumental in convincing the captain of the Mayflower uh, that instead of finding the mouth of the Hudson River, that they should go ahead and dock in a place called Cape Cod. And uh, the reason was that they could either stay there in Cape Cod as free men, or they continue 65 miles south to the mouth of the Hudson River, where he said they would either be shipwrecked, uh, or they would uh, find the Hudson and basically work as slaves. All these entire pilgrim group would work as slaves seven days a week for seven years um, and to settle the, the contract they had with the Virginia Company of London. Um, said that had, had they gone on, they wouldn't even own their homes that they built. Um, what had happened was originally the Virginia Company of London required them that they would work five days a week, but they would keep their homes and in addition to their share of land, uh, they would keep their homes. But just before the Mayflower set sail, the company reneged on their offer and said that they would work seven years, seven days a week. So I think they, they set sail with a bad taste in their mouth for the Virginia Company of London. And so once uh, they got to Cape Cod, they decided that they could either go on and become indentured servants for all time for seven years and uh, or... They could stay where they were in Cape Cod and settle there as free men. And uh, Stephen was instrumental in convincing them that they should actually stay where they were, form their own body of government, and enact their own laws for their own settlement, which became known as the Mayflower Contract, uh, Compact, excuse me, the Mayflower Compact. And Stephen was a signatory to this compact as were most of the other men who were aboard the Mayflower at that time. So once they had settled, and this actually took place on the Mayflower itself, the compact was signed on the ship before they, uh, before they disembarked. And uh, once they had agreed that, they'd established themselves politically. Um, Stephen was one of the first to set foot at Plymouth Rock and was part of the advance team to explore the area around Cape Cod looking for a place that they could establish the Plymouth Colony. And uh, there's also uh, some interesting stories about, a, there's actually a plaque up in Massachusetts called the First Encounter, 
where they were attacked by the Nasset tribe. Um, it said that when uh, Samoset and Squanto came to Plymouth uh, as some of the first interactions with the pilgrims, that they, these, these Indian chiefs and a number of the Indian tribe leaders stayed with Stephen Hopkins in his home uh, there. And uh, one of the things that I found, it said he led one of the first expeditions inland to visit, visit Massasoit. And uh, he was also one of the participants of the legendary first Thanksgiving that took place with 50 colonists, Massasoit, and 90 of his men uh, that he brought with him. Um, he served as an assistant to the governor of the Plymouth colonies. Uh, he built, built the first wharf that was in Plymouth. Uh, he also helped negotiate a peace treaty uh, with the Indians in Massasoit, which lasted for 50 years, and they pledged each other their mutual defense. And so because of this treaty, Stevens was, Stephen was actually able to set up a very productive fur trade uh, with the Indians. And those furs were uh, shipped back to England as a primary method to repay the debt that they owed to a lot of these merchant venturers uh, who had helped fund them uh, to come to the New World in the first place. Um, so Stephen and his uh, wife Elizabeth had five more children. And uh, when he died in 1844, he had 18 grandchildren, um, one great-grandchild, and, of course, generations to come, of which we are a part. Um, uh, I, I just thought that was kind of interesting. The other thing I wanted to, to mention here um, was that when the Sea Venture was run ashore or, or grounded or the, the shipwreck of the sea venture in, in Bermuda. Um, of course, he lived through that and uh, ended up going back to England. But a man by the name of William Shakespeare had heard the story of the sea venture and the things that went on there. And um, in one of uh, Shakespeare's plays, and I'm not a big Shakespeare fan and I don't know him, but there is a play that Shakespeare wrote called the, the Tempest. And in The Tempest, um, I can tell you that uh, I actually did a little bit of looking here. Um, Stefano, sounds a little bit like Stephen, was a boisterous and often drunk butler of King Alonzo in the play The Tempest. Uh, and the Stefano... Trinculo and Taliban plot against Prospero, the ruler of an island in which the play is set, and the former Duke of Milan in Shakespeare's fictional universe. In the play, he wants to take over the island and marry Prospero's daughter, Miranda. Um, Caliban believes Stefano to be, a good, uh, to be a god because he gave him wine to drink, which Caliban believes healed him. Um, Many historians and scholars uh, believe that the character of Stefano was modeled after Stephen Hopkins from London. And I thought that was kind of an interesting, uh, interesting point. Um, one other thing I just wanted to pass along that, uh, you know, he was a, a man of, uh, really had some great adventures, uh, of course, setting off on his own, being shipwrecked, uh, helping with the founding and seeing the demise of Jamestown. Uh, returning again on the Mayflower uh, as one of those original pilgrims and all the things he did, um, pretty impressive. Um, however, uh, it says that in the late 1630s, um, Stephen began to kind of run afoul of some of the Plymouth uh, authorities. And uh, apparently he opened up a shop and served alcohol, of all things, um, in 1636, he got into a fight with a man by the name of John Tisdale, and was uh, and Stephen actually seriously wounded him. Um, in 1637, he was fined for allowing drinking and shuffleboard to be played on Sunday. Um, just quite a rabble rouser. Um, in 1638, he was fined for allowing people to drink excessively in his house. And uh, one of his guests, William Reynolds, was fined uh, because he was part of that drunken uh, group that met uh, in his house. Uh, and uh, But all the rest were acquitted there.
1638, he was fined twice for selling beer at twice the actual value. Uh, and in 1639, he was uh, fined for selling a looking glass, which is a mirror, at twice what it would be cost if it was bought in the Bay Colony. Um, and then finally, the, the last quick story here, in 1638, uh, Stephen Hopkins had a maidservant by the name of Dorothy, who became pregnant by a man by the name of Arthur Peach. Now, Arthur Peach was executed for murdering an Indian in cold blood, and um, the Plymouth Court decided that Stephen Hopkins should be responsible financially for Dorothy and her child for the next two years because that was the amount of time that was remaining in her term of service with the Hopkins family. Now, Stephen, in contempt of court, uh, threw Dorothy out of his household and refused to provide for her. So the court arrested Stephen and held him in jail until a man by the name of Holmes stepped up and purchased the remaining two years of Dorothy's service and agreed to support both her and the child. And uh, Stephen, of course, died in uh, 1644 and asked that he be buried next to his wife. And they are both uh, buried now in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And uh, I did find a, a headstone marker. You can look on the internet and see that as well as a plaque commemorating what I mentioned, the, the first attack of the uh, Indians on the uh, pilgrims when they arrived in, uh, in Massachusetts. So uh, very interesting story of a, a wanderer and an adventurer um, who decided that he would rather be free than uh, be in servitude. Now, the fact that he signed a contract and didn't want to follow through on it, well, I'm not here to judge in uh, different times and different conditions. But uh, I think we can take pride in the fact that here was uh, one of our ancestors who worked very hard to get to this country and uh, worked very hard to uh, make sure that uh, he had what he could to provide for his family in a way that he could be free. And uh, I think that's kind of interesting. So thanks again for stopping by. We'll talk to you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.